peace be upon him he said that when Allah is pleased with someone from amongst his slaves or whether it's a male or female Allah tells the angel Gabriel about it and the angel Gabriel tells all the other angels about it and then all of them love this person because God loves this person and slowly this love descends until the people on this world the people on this earth also begin to love him this is the effects if God loves you if God loves you over time people will love you and the angels will love you and even as one of the brothers mentioned earlier even the fish and the birds will pray for you how do we earn the love of God then this takes us to our final question how do we work our way towards the ideal relationship with God obviously the first step if you're not a Muslim I ask you to study Islam or if you already have to become a Muslim don't waste time about it convert to Islam inshallah submit to your Creator that's the first step if you have taken this step you need you now need to earn the love of God how do you do this Allah tells us this in the Quran he says Kul in kuntum Allah, Allah. say O oh Muhammad say to the people that if you truly love Allah you're not just claiming to love Allah you truly love God you truly love your Creator then follow me meaning follow the Prophet Muhammad follow the Prophet Muhammad then Allah will love you if you want Allah to love you if you want God to love you if you want your Creator to love you you have to follow his Prophet you have to follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him the greatest human being to walk the face of this earth and I say that with 100% conviction having studied his life story multiple times and studied the life stories of many other people he was the greatest human to walk the face of this earth he was the best of character he was the best of husbands he was the best of fathers he was the most amazing person whose life I have ever read he is a person worth following you follow him God will love you he will and there's another narration where the Prophet peace be upon him said that God says he says that nothing you do brings you closer to God than, than fulfilling your obligations meaning if you want to be close to God the first thing you need to do is fulfill all your obligations towards him after that you want to get even closer do extra do more you are praying five times a day start praying the extra prayers start praying the late night prayer the qiyamul layl or the tahajjud prayer do these extra things you will get even closer to God until as the, the hadith narration continues that everything you do it is as if God is making you do it he's telling you what to do he's showing you what to do and then if you are in that state if you are that close to God then whatever you say whatever prayer you make to God he will answer it because he loves you and if he loves you he's going to answer your prayer now I need to divert again a little bit because a lot of this it sounds you know Alhamdulillah very good very nice but it's also a condition here that we need to realize before we take this jump that condition is that as I said life is a test so if you've passed the test of knowing what is the right path and you have passed the test of choosing the right path your next test after this is that God is going to put hardships in the way of you going across this path okay he is going to put hardships in your life to test you to see how sincere you really are and there's a narration that says the people who had the hardest test were the prophets we know the story of Jesus the story of Abraham the Muslims and uh, hopefully many of the non-Muslims know the story of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him the hardships we go through were nowhere on the same level as them they went through hardships even worse than we can ever imagine the, that he said the people who had the hardest test were the prophets after them those who are the most pious they are the next people who have the hardest tests so this world and I'm not going to beat around the bush about this and make things sound too rosy this world is a test if you choose to the right path you are going to be tested if you don't choose the right path you already failed the test but you will be tested God says this in the beginning of Surah An-Kabut He says Ahasiban nasu Does mankind think that you just say we believe and that's it you will be left alone? He says no we tested those who came before you so we can expose the sincere ones from the liars to expose the sincere ones from the liars God already knows who's truthful and who's lying but for us ourselves to realize 
you know, that we are on the straight path or not, we are put through tests. And one of the beautiful things about Islam, a true believer in Islam, even the test he regards as a blessing. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that the, uh, the affair of the believer is amazing. It's surprising in that whatever happens to him is good for him. If something goes wrong in his life and he's patient and he passed that test, that is good for him. He gets rewarded for that. If something goes wrong in your life and you're, and you're patient for that, God forgives you for some of your sins, He raises your status, you become closer to Him. Isn't that a good thing? It's a good thing. And if things are going right in his life and he's still grateful to God, he doesn't forget about God, this is also a good thing. So whether things are going right or things are going wrong, if you have a strong relationship with God and you are doing the right thing, it's always a good thing. It's always a good thing. Whatever happens to you is a good thing. You know, if something goes wrong in your life, if you try your best to pass this test, then something good will definitely come out of it. You will see the benefits of it. The best story about this, which we Muslims all believe in and know of, is the story of the Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. Those of you who do not know this story, including our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, is in the Quran, there's an entire chapter called the chapter of Yusuf, the chapter of Joseph. Read that chapter. In his, in his life, his brothers tried to kill him. He gets taken as a slave. He gets thrown in jail for not committing any crime. In jail, he meets someone who becomes the friend of the ruler. And this person introduces him to the ruler. And he becomes the minister of the ruler. And finally, he becomes the ruler himself. How? What happened? His brothers tried to kill him. He got taken away and became a slave. He got thrown in jail. Why did God allow all this to happen? So he can become the ruler. This is how God works. And this is what we Muslims believe. And this is the reason why Muslims have the lowest suicide rate in the world. Our relationship with God keeps us strong no matter what goes wrong in life. Anything goes wrong, God willed it. There's some benefit behind it. Anything goes wrong, God willed it. There must be some good in it. And this is the relationship we all have to strive towards. We all need to work towards this. Whether we are Muslim or whatever we are, whatever religion we follow, don't think that my relationship with God is perfect. We are all humans. We all make mistakes. We all commit sins. You know, as long as we are trying our best to please God, as long as we are trying our best to be good, then He will look. He will overlook our mistakes, and by the will of God, we might be counted amongst His friends. But if we say, you know, I'm a sinful person, I'm not even going to bother trying. Well, then don't expect God to overlook your mistakes because you're not making an effort. If you make an effort, even if you still have sins and mistakes, God will look at your effort and for this reason He might forgive you. So, in conclusion, I would like to say that for each and every one of us, the main purpose of this topic is not just to listen to a lecture, but to introspect. Think about it. Think about everything that was said. Think about what role does your Creator play in your life. If it does not play a big role in your life, it's time to start changing the way you love your life. Because 90% of the, of, the, of the world, or we can say 95% of the world, all exist that our Creator, all agree that our Creator exists. It's just a handful of people who are atheists. So majority of us agree that He exists. Are we giving Him His rights? Are we doing what we need to do? And when you fulfill the rights of God, you will fulfill the rights of humanity. Do you know why? Because to fulfill the rights of God, you have to be a practicing Muslim. Being a practicing Muslim means to be good to everybody. That's part of fulfilling the rights of God. So it, it leads to that. It leads to it. That by fulfilling God's rights, you can only do that by fulfilling the rights of others as well. So don't think by getting involved in this, you'll have to start neglecting your father, or neglecting your mother, or neglecting your wife. No. Fulfilling their rights is part of fulfilling God's rights as well. So, in conclusion, I pray to our Creator, to God Almighty, that He guides each and every one of us not just to submit to Him, but to reach a level where we become His friends. Where we become from those who, as He mentioned in the Quran, when they die, He says, Inna awliyaullahi la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. The friends of Allah, when they die, they don't have any fear, nor are they sad. The angels will come to them and give them good news. And then He says, who these awliya are? He says, they are those who have correct belief and they have piety, they have God-consciousness. 
So we all want this. You know, to actually die in a state that you are happy to die instead of being scared to die. And the only way to do this is to improve our relationship with God. So I ask our Creator to help each of us reach that level and to put guidance in the hearts of each and every one of us and to make this lecture, inshallah, beneficial to each and every one of us. May peace and blessings be upon the Messenger of God and all of us who follow His way with righteousness. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. That was really informative and commendable speech. And your insights really made us wear a thinking cap. And inshallah, we'll be doing introspection soon. Inshallah. Now we'll move forward for a very interesting session of the event, uh, the QA session. To drive more benefit for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following guidelines or rules to be observed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic only. Questions not relevant to the topic will not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. This is a question and answer time and not a lecture or a debate time. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you will have to go at the back of the line again and await your second chance for questioning. Two mics have been provided for the questions from the audience. One for the gents there in the middle of the uh, you know crown, and second uh, one for the ladies. Please stand in a queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker and speak into the mic only when the mic handling assistant hand the mic to you. We will allow one question on each of the mics alternatively. Written questions on the slips which are available from our volunteers on the sides would be given second preference after the open questions on the mics are answered by the speaker. In the interest of not having any time wasted on irrelevant issues and to ensure more educative and, in and interesting QA session, our decision to allow or disallow irrelevant questions will be final. We would prefer non-Muslim questioner over Muslim questioner, so it's a humble request to all of our Muslim brothers here to give chance to our non-Muslim brothers for asking questions. In the interest of getting a proper and clear answer from the speaker, kindly state your name and profession before uh, putting forth your question. So, may we have the first question from our brother's side. Brother, could you please mention your name and profession and ask your question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm a student. Uh, my name is Umair. Uh, I would like to ask how important is intention uh, while maintaining your relation with God? How important is intention? Just to repeat the question to make sure I understood it properly. You want to know how important is the intention? Your intention when it comes to maintaining your relationship with God? Yes. Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Well, essentially your relationship with God is primarily an internal thing. So it depends almost entirely on your intention. And in Islam, the primary condition for any deed to be acceptable is the intention. Any deed to be acceptable to God, the primary condition is that you have a sincere intention. You are not doing a good deed to show off. You are not doing a good deed so people think that you are a righteous and holy man. You are doing it for the sake of God. And that's the only way to create a relationship with God. Um, if you, for example, in the human terms, if you are being good to your wife, just in front of your parents, so your parents think you are a good husband, it's not going to change your relationship with your wife. So if you are doing your obligations towards God, just so people think you are a good Muslim, that's not going to help you strengthen your relationship with God. Okay, so the primary and the most important thing is to always be sincere. Always ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing it because I want people to like me or am I doing it because I want God to like me? That is the most important thing. And some people, they, on the same point, they bring up an issue that uh, can wanting to go to paradise, is that a good intention or is that a bad intention? And the answer is, it's a good intention. If it was not a good intention, God wouldn't have mentioned it in, in the Quran, and He would not have mentioned it in the Bible, and in 
<coughs> many of the other holy scriptures and he would not have made it something that we desire. The fact that he put it there as something we should be desiring shows that wanting to go to paradise is also a good intention. And it also will help you strengthen your relationship with God. Okay. Second question from Sister's side. Please mention your name and profession. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Khatija and I'm studying. My question is, when we lose something which we really love, we try to find it. But when I lose my Iman, why don't I try to find it? How will I find it? Generally, when people lose their Iman, there's two situations. The first is where they know and the second is where they don't know. Some people don't know. They are so caught up in their lives and in what they are doing that they don't even realize that what they have doing has caused them to lose faith or to break their relationship with the Creator. For such a person, again, introspection is the only way to realize that you are wrong. Now, there are many people who know that they are wrong, but there are certain things that are preventing them from coming right. Firstly, the only way to get back your belief and to get back on the straight path is to make a sincere intention and to pray to God and to try and be a good Muslim. That's what you need to do. But, you know, for those, for many people, they are scared to do this. And so it might be for a variety of reasons. Somebody, maybe their whole life, they're not practicing Islam. And now they're scared if they start growing a beard or they start wearing a hijab, their friends are going to laugh at them, people are going to point fingers at them, people are going to call them extremists, and so this fear stops them. But obviously it shouldn't stop you, because you know, your relationship with God is more important than your relationship with people who laugh at you for worshipping Him. It's much more important. So, those of us who are in the situation where we know what's the right thing to do, we know that we are... You know, we have lost our relationship with our Creator, but we are scared because of what people will say. You need to think about it because no matter what you do, people won't be happy with you. No matter what you do, people won't be happy with you. There is an analogy in Islam, it's a very, uh, amongst Muslims, it's a very funny analogy that we always quote, that a father and son were walking with a donkey. And as they passed by the first group of people, the father was sitting on the donkey. So the people looked and said, what a disrespectful, uh, what a bad old man is this? He's making his young son walk. So he got off and he made his son ride the donkey. As they continued walking, another group of people said, what a disrespectful child, he's making his father walk. So they both got on the donkey and they started riding. Then people looked at him and said, what kind of people are this? Then they think about the donkey's feelings, how can you carry two people? So they both decided to carry the donkey. Then people said, what idiots are these? They got a donkey and they're not riding it. The lesson of the story is simple. Whatever you do, don't expect everybody to be pleased with you. So focus on pleasing those who matter. And the person who matters the most is your Creator. On the day of judgment, after we die, nobody else matters. On that day, if God is angry with you, your friends can't help you. The friend who stopped you from growing your beard, or stopped you from converting to Islam, or stopped you from wearing your hijab, he's not going to be able to save you on the day of judgment. So this is far more important than that individual. You become a practicing person, obviously you remain kind and nice to the others, and you try to bring them along with you, but if they don't come along with you, God comes first. He always comes first before everybody else. Next question from the other side. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Sunny. I work in the IT sector. I have one question regarding a certain type of people. There are the types of people who really want to improve their relationship with God, but it's just not possible because, you know, urban lifestyle, you've always got deadlines and lots of things to do. But for these type of people, whenever their relationship cannot improve, it hurts them. They really want to do something, but they just can't because of the lifestyle, especially the urban lifestyle and the IT sector. Things are so tight. So how, um, how are these people going to tackle this issue? And what suggestions do you have for them to improve their relationship? Something that they really want to do but just can't. In a few words, where there's a will, there's a way. But what we need to do is if you are serious about improving your relationship with God, you can make time for it. We have time management. Nowadays, there are many uh, websites, there are many courses, there are many uh, books that teach you time management. It's very important. I myself have a very busy day, I have a very busy schedule. 
But I make sure I make time for my wife, time for my kids, time for my work, time for my creator. You have to do this. You have to learn time management. So people who are involved in these fields that take a lot of time, you just need a bit of time management. You just need to set up a schedule. Okay, this is the prayer time. This is my work time. This is family time. And you stick to your schedule. You can make time. You can find time. It takes you to maybe sacrifice maybe some of your fun time maybe my sacrifice some of your fun time you know sometimes uh, people who say this uh, really sometimes it's just an excuse for example i know uh, some people who i'll give them a half an hour lecture cd to listen to and you meet them one month later i'm sorry i just couldn't find time to listen to the lecture but during that month they watch the entire lord of the rings trilogy which is a nine and a half hour movie series three times but they couldn't find time for half an hour so many times it's not that we can't find time, it's we don't make time. And it's up to us to sacrifice a bit of our fun time, to sacrifice a bit of our spare time to focus on this. Because it is that, if it is that important to you, you will find time, you will make time. Just like you made time to attend this. If you have such a busy lifestyle, you made time to attend a three hour lecture. Can't you make time to pray for half an hour in the entire day, split up into five minutes, five minutes in the morning before sunrise, five minutes at lunchtime, five minutes in the afternoon, five minutes in the evening, and five minutes before going to bed, you have Fajr, Zuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. It's just five minutes each. You can make time. It's just a psychological barrier making you think that you can't. Next question from Sister Saif. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Fatima. I'm a homemaker. The other day I had been giving a dawah to one of my friends. She accepts that she is doing wrong. And she says, Allah is Ghafoor Rahim. Allah is Wadud. Allah is going to forgive me. What's, we are the Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Anything we do, Allah Ta'ala, she quotes the hadith telling that anyone who um, gives shahada will enter Jannah. So what's the point? How will I tackle with her? There's actually many ways to confront this argument. Um, I want to first start off with uh, a bit of a, you know, a, a example of how this works. Just say you know somebody who's merciful, or perhaps it's your parents. You have a very loving father, a very merciful father. He treats you nicely, he forgives you when you do wrong things. Is it right for you to do wrong things because your father is nice? Does that give you the right to do wrong things? Don't you feel guilty? I got such a good and nice father. How can I do things that displease him? Even if he's still not treating me badly. Don't you feel that guilt? So why when it comes to our creator, we don't feel that guilt? We have such a merciful creator who has given us so much in this world. Don't you feel guilty for not for doing sins? Don't you feel guilty for not doing the right thing? God is merciful. But there's a very fine line between mercy and being too soft. And so Allah has set guidelines for His mercy. He is merciful to those who deserve His mercy. In one verse He says that God is Ghafoorul Ra'is, Ghafoorul Rahim, He is most forgiving, most merciful, Wahuwa Shadidul Iqab, but He is also most severe in His punishment. The bottom line is, don't try to take advantage of God's mercy. When you try to take advantage of God's mercy, you are literally playing with fire, the hellfire. You are playing with it. You are trying to take advantage of God. What kind of a person tries to take advantage of God? We regard it as low need to take advantage of another human being and we want to make excuses and take advantage of God and treat him like a joke. So this type of attitude, it is a very disgraceful attitude. And it is treating our creator like a joke. And people who think that they just really need to think to themselves about what they are doing, it is very, very wrong. It is insulting to the Creator. He is merciful to you and you decide to disobey Him because of that. Shame on you. Shame on you for thinking like that. Please, next question from Brother's side. Assalamu alaikum. Abdul Hafiz, I am a student. Uh, what does God ultimately gets when we pray five times? It's true that we are saved from sins and uh, ultimately that what God wants for us to go to heaven but what does he ultimately get when we pray five times and we fast as Muslims we believe God doesn't need anything and he doesn't benefit from us if everybody in this world pray to God he'd still be the perfect God if nobody on earth pray to God he'll still be the perfect God he 
wants us to pray for him there's two levels to it one is God's side one is our side we as humans we need to look at it from our side okay that God created us he put us here we are here we have been given a mission we need to do it for our sakes for our own sake we need to do it from God's perspective you know people can ask questions why bother creating in the first place why create human beings why didn't he make me an alien why didn't he make my skin green why didn't he give me six hands this is for God this is his business it's not our business we as Muslims need to we as Muslims we have this belief and we have this understanding that there are things about God which he only understands why because our minds are limited our knowledge is limited our intellect is limited every day we're learning something new every day we realize something we knew before was wrong well God is perfect and so the limited can never grasp everything about the unlimited the finite can never grasp everything about the infinite if we did we'd be God if we understood God's every intention his every move everything he does we had all his knowledge we'd be God but this relationship exists and this is where the submission comes in to accept that okay God has put me in this situation God is most wise, He's most knowledgeable. He has created me, He has put me here. It's now up to me to worship Him. I don't have any say in the matter. If I don't worship Him, I'll be in trouble. I'm, it's not my right to tell Him why. For example, in human terms, it's not the school child's right to tell the principal, why is this the school uniform? Why can't that be the school uniform? No, we don't ask these questions to people of authority because we assume, we understand that they know better than us. So if we assume people of authority know better than us in these situations. God who is all knowledgeable, all wise, He knows better than us in all situations. So when we worship God, He doesn't benefit, we benefit. We get inner peace, we get fulfilled, we get this uh, satisfaction, we get this relationship with Him. Our hearts become happy, our lives become purposeful. We now begin to live life in such a way that even when things go wrong, we are still content, we are still happy. It, it helps us in every way. So this is for our good, it's not for God. God doesn't need it, we need it. That's the simple answer. Next question from Sister Sain. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. This question is um, regarding one of the sisters who is present here. I'm asking on behalf of her. She wants to know, is that hardships come only in the way of a pious person from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Does hardship come only by, to a pious person from Allah? And the answer is no. Hardship affects every human being. Every human being experiences some problem. But it varies. If you are someone who is living an unrighteous life and this hardship uh, doesn't make you a better person, then it's a punishment from God. If you are living an unrighteous life and this hardship causes you to turn your life around and become a better person, then that was a blessing from God. If you are a righteous person and hardship comes your way and you remain righteous, it's a blessing from God, it's a test from God. So hardship affects everyone. But how it impacts you depends on your relationship with God. If you have a strong relationship with God, you take every hardship as a test. If you don't have a relationship with God, you take every hardship as a punishment or as God doesn't love me or you know you, people think like this, they make statements like this because they don't have that relationship. So whatever way we go through life, something might go wrong somewhere down our lives but if you have a strong relationship with God, it pulls you through, it helps you pass the test. So yes, hardship affects everyone. It's just for the believer, sometimes if he is very righteous, he can be on a higher level but for a believer, he has the tools to make it through a hardship in a way that he comes out a stronger and better person. Next question from Brother Sai. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Said Jasim. I'm doing my post graduation in pharmacy. I have a question for my non Muslim friend. Can you cite the intellectual and logical explanation of the Holy Quran for the idol worshippers? Can you please repeat the question again? Can you cite the intellectual and logical explanation of the Holy Quran for the idol worshippers? Is your question, what is the intellectual arguments of the idol worshippers or against them? Against that. Against them. Well, there's multiple. One is what I mentioned throughout this lecture. That God created you, He gave you everything. He put you here for a purpose. It is taking away His right to worship an idol. 
This is wrong. It's going against his rights. This is what the Quran says. And the Quran also goes on to say that these things can't benefit you. You're worshipping an idol. It can't do anything to you. If God is angry with you, what is an idol going to do to stop him? That is what it is. Uh, that is what the Quran's argument is. That if God is angry with you, nothing can help you. Leave an idol. A human can't help you either. An animal can't help you either. An angel won't try to help you if God is angry with you. So the rational is, if you want to please God, if you want to go to paradise, then do what He wants, not what you want. Did God give you permission to worship idols? Almost any of the revealed religions, if you go back to the scriptures, whether it's the Jewish scripture, the Muslim scripture, the Christian scripture, it says that idol worship or worshipping anything besides God is wrong. This is what He has revealed throughout time, from the time of Adam. Did Adam worship, worship any idols? Anybody believes that Adam worshipped an idol? No, he was a Muslim. He believed and submitted to the will of the one God. So, idol worship, it is wrong from a variety of angles. It is giving God's right to someone besides God. It is, uh, it is something which will not benefit you in any way whatsoever. And it is against the very purpose of our existence. So these are some ways to uh, approach this issue. Another uh, argument to, that Allah brings forth in the Quran to those who believe in other gods, not just the idol, but other gods out there besides God, is that if other gods existed, this world would fall apart, it'd be chaos. One God wants you to die today, the other God wants you to live. What's going to happen to you? Half your body will live, half your body will die? If one God wants it to rain, one God wants it to be sunny, what's going to happen? Yeah. One God wants some, something to happen, the other wants the opposite. It doesn't work like that. The entire universe is working with a system. That shows the unity that there's just one God. And there's just one God, there's no reason whatsoever to worship anyone besides that one God. Next question from Sister Sai. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Aisha. I'm a robot and I'm married. My parents are totally against Islam. How do I call them towards Islam? MashaAllah, may Allah increase your iman and make you a means of guidance for them. Uh, if they are primarily against Islam, your first step is to show them through your actions that Islam has made you a better person.